What we're going to do is answer some of your questions before we get into our final material because I think that some of you have some really good questions here. Your Excellency, your story about the old church in Montana was great, but you didn't tell us whether you got permission off of the mass there. So this is what happened. <clears throat> Thank you. That's okay. Um, I've tried to have mass there a couple of times, and the answer has always been no. On one occasion, uh, I told the priest that uh, we just come down climbing from the mountain. I'm sunburned. I'm tired. I'm hot. I'm not feeling good, and I got to have mass in the morning. And he said, "Well, maybe you're too sick to have mass." So I said, "Oh, but I, I always have mass. I have mass every day, and I, I offer it up, and etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. So this is what he did. I was with a seminarian. The rest of the seminarians and border boys or altar boys are at Charles Waters Campground. Hot mosquitoes, and all that stuff. And the, the, the Novus Ordo priest said, well, you could just stay in the rectory here. You can do your laundry here, take a shower, and you can sleep here, and then we'll figure something out in the morning. Hmm, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> so we drove back and said, uh, I'm going to try to have Mass still there, but I don't know what he's going to say, yes or no. But in the morning, uh, he had already had outside the door something we use for an altar. He said, I, I really can't give you permission. I'd get in trouble. He was friendly. He said, I, I get, if, if it got out that I let you have mass here, I'd really get in a lot of trouble. But you can have mass out by the cemetery there. And there in the cemetery was where that Indian girl was that Our Lady appeared to. And Stevensville, St. Mary's, the old church, has a mural of Our Blessed Mother appearing to this Indian woman, Indian girl. And this is a beautiful story. It's in, I think, also uh, several books. But this Indian girl wanted to make her first Holy Communion. And the Jesuits priest said, no, you don't know your catechism yet. And when you know your catechism, we'd be happy to give you Jesus. And next day she said she knew her catechism. The priest said, no, my child, it's not good that you lie. She says, no. So he started asking the questions. The girl knew all the answers to the catechism. <clears throat> and they asked, how did you know how did you learn so quickly? He says, I prayed to Mary, and she appeared to me and taught me last night. So they have a picture of the, the, Our Lady appearing to this Indian girl. Well, that Indian girl is buried in that cemetery there. i never forget because we had everything set up for Mass, and the only thing I didn't have was water. And so the seminary said, well, I said, I don't want to bother that modern priest again. I said, oh, you know, there's, there's an alfalfa field there, and there's one of those uh, irrigation going, ch ch going around a circle. The seminarian's running a circle going like this, <laughs> trying to get water in a cruet <laughs> and not get wet. So <laughs> he comes running back like, I think I got it here. So we didn't have Mass at St. Mary's, but we did have Mass at the cemetery, which was very, very nice. Um, somebody asked about exorcisms. And I'm sure some of you heard the story, some of you didn't, but I'll make a real long story real short. Many moons ago, as the Indians say, uh, when Father Gregory was in Omaha, this woman was visiting from out of state, uh, Minnesota, to be, uh, as a fat matter of fact, <clears throat> and she, after Mass, wanted to talk to Father. She said she was visiting some relatives in Omaha, and and that uh, she wanted to talk to Father about an exorcism. Her daughter was in her 20s and going through some you know, very bad episodes of what she thought was diabolical possession. And she said for two years, the modern church, I think all the modern churches, the Catholic church in our area has been doing this exorcism. There's an older priest and a younger priest, and she had the names. And there's also a letter from the Archbishop of St. Paul uh, telling her to stick it out and hang in there and don't go anywhere else and you know, keep working at it, et cetera, et cetera. She just said, we've gone two years without any results. So Father Gregory called me. I said, get the information. When I get back, we'll go over it. In the meantime, she drove back to Minnesota. And uh, so we looked at the information. The, the two priests that were offering the, or doing the exorcism, one was definitely validly ordained. We looked up in the Catholic directory. His ordination was a valid ordination. The younger priest was not. And... <clears throat> 
and, and then I told Father Greg, get as much information from witnesses and this and that. There were actually two doctors who examined this girl and said that, you know, she was, you know, perfectly uh, sane, uh, nothing extraordinary they could see psychologically that would be a cause of concern. Whatever's happening, they said, is beyond our competence. So then we had to try to figure out, okay, who uh, and who's going to do the exorcism? And it's not just like a one-time, do it in the afternoon and get it over with. It might take a couple of days. might even take a week. It might take two weeks. And then how are we going to spot for those priests, et cetera? So it had to be a priest that can break away, and we can cover for them and, and able to do it. So we got a hold of Father Dominic Radecki and also Father Michael Anaya. But this woman was saying that her daughter can become extraordinarily strong through the exorcism and that we need to have some people there to hold her down. i never forget, I called Daryl Block. Those of you from Minnesota know Daryl. And called Daryl and Daryl, oh, hi, Bishop, how's it going? Yeah, it's great. Uh, Daryl, need a favor? Yeah, sure, anything. I said, uh, two of our priests can be doing an exorcism and we need someone to hold this uh, possessed person down. Could you do it? <laughs> Daryl. Hello, Daryl. <laughs> Not something you get asked all the time. <laughs> I couldn't see what he looked like, but I can imagine he's running his hand through his hair like, I suppose we could do it for a day. So he did it for a day. And then he did it the next day. He did it for the whole time. And I think, uh, where is she? Maria, are you, you were there, weren't you? Was it something that increased your faith? It was something very, very real. This this girl, I wasn't there. I had Father call me every night, tell me how things were going. But they had, she was sitting in a wood chair, and uh, but weighed about 110, 115 pounds, 120 pounds, maybe. Wasn't that, she was very petite. I'm guessing, I don't know, I'm asking. Normal, yep. Daryl said he could put his whole hand around her wrist. She just, that's skinny of her wrist, just wasn't a very big young lady. She was very petite and held her down. And he said at a certain point he was, he was like he was using maximum strength and she's still taking a chair off the ground. Uh, the sisters, it was at their convent out in the country. And uh, the sisters showed me the chair that was, was basically broken through. It was a wooden chair. Now, I'm not going to tell you how much I weigh, but if I jumped up and tried to slam that chair, I couldn't break it myself. So how she could do that was extraordinary. Father... Uh, Dominic and Father Naya did the exorcism. Uh, they were uh, very, uh, uh, how would you say, uh, focused on doing this well and staying the course and persevering. And I don't know, they, they, about 10 days. Uh, holy water, they said there was a big difference when she was really acting up to get hit with holy water that she just like become limp. And it was especially the holy water that was blessed on Easter vigil. That that seemed to have a little bit more, not a little bit, but a lot more power than the ordinary blessing of holy water because the, the, the ceremonies are much more um, detailed. <clears throat> uh, at one point, grabbed one of the priests' stole and ripped it with her mouth. Uh, and Father Naya took the stole and he couldn't tear it himself, pulling all his might. Uh, crazy. This is really, really crazy. But during the time of the exorcism, there was a comment made about that Benedict was going to resign. And like, yeah, right. And three or four days later, Benedict steps down. So you got knowledge of something that's just whatever. And Father and I, he's not here, is he? Nope. Father Dominic, is he here? Nope. Okay, they can't defend themselves. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, for me, it was a lot of spitting, a lot of vomiting, and just really ugly stuff coming out, really ugly stuff. Um uh, Seemed like it reached a peak and then it started to decline, and pretty soon this girl was back to normal. Real sweet, easygoing, laid back kid. But interestingly, uh, that was one, one uh, exorcism that, after looking at everything, and w we try to be very careful because if somebody has psychological problems, you don't want to be doing an exorcism and putting ideas in their head. That makes it worse. So one of the things that we come to realize, though, is, is that obviously these things like exorcisms and possessions do take place, <clears throat> but I would be very, very 
We try to be very skeptical and very discreet about is this truly possession or is it more what we consider somebody having psychological and emotional problems and imagining things. I was talking to Father Heine in Germany, Father Johannes Heine, and he said that after that one movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, how many saw that? And he said, okay. After that, well, maybe it was after The Exorcist uh, movie had come out, there were all sorts of people in Europe claiming that they were possessed by the devil. You know, somebody could have emotional problems or psychological problems and see a movie like that and say, it's me, you know. So you, want, you don't want to waste a priest's time because exorcism is very serious, so you want to make sure that it, it looked into and investigated carefully. I remember Father Clement Kubish uh, in the 70s when he was here. He told a story about this one woman, farm lady, called up and said, there are strange things happening at her farmhouse. And uh, Father could tell that she was very agitated. He said, well, can you explain what? She says, my, my vacuum cleaner, it's turning on and off. And, 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 and he says, now, now, come on. This, they, sometimes, you know, you pull on your vacuum cleaner and the cords get pulled and the wires aren't connecting. And she says, Father, it's not plugged in. <laughs> so, <laughs> he said, oh. <laughs> The same thing with the TV was going on and off, too, and it wasn't plugged in. So uh, he had gone there, did an exorcism, calmed down, and to come right back again, did a second time, calm, calm down, and come back again. So he said, okay, what was different with your house two weeks ago that wasn't there three weeks ago? She said, well, I went to a second-hand store and got a bed. Get rid of the bed. Burn it. Well, she said, get rid of the bed. That's what he said. Get rid of the bed. So, you know, farmers have this junkyard of old vehicles. Most of them do, or, you know, they you always got parts you could sell or take off of. So she had picked a bed out to the, the junk part where the old cars were and the lights in, the, in that one of the cars were going on and off and on and off. There's no battery in the car, but it had gone on and off. So he finally said, just burn it. So she burned it. There's no more problem. So is there a devil? Absolutely. Satan, I think his greatest uh, trick is to be um, as if he doesn't exist, that he's not there. And yet... We should not underestimate his cleverness, his deceitfulness. Uh, he's a fallen angel, and, and Satan and his legions are very, very clever to try to deceive even the elect. I and mean, that's kind of something we can get into in the next talk. But I wanted to uh, shoot through these questions here. Uh, someone's asking about Holy Communion of the both species. Why don't we receive not only the host but out of the chalice? At the Council of Trent, this question was answered very clearly. It's not required by Christ himself, because he says, and he said, he who eats this bread shall live forever, and the bread that I will give you is my flesh for the life of the world. For sure, the priest, as he represents Christ, the Holy Eucharist is consecrated within the Mass. So the Holy Eucharist is a sacrifice and a sacrament but it becomes the Holy Eucharist during the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. The Mass is the renewal of Christ's death on the cross. It has to signify the shedding of blood. That's the right. There's a separate consecration of the bread and the wine. The separate consecrations signifies Christ's shedding of his blood. And when a priest says the consecration over the, over the chalice, which shall be shed unto the remission of sins. This is the chalice of my blood, etc. Now, it's absolutely essential that the priest who offers Mass, he consecrates and receives the Holy Eucharist under both species. But when you receive, you receive Jesus whole and entire in the host. I was talking to a Greek Orthodox young lady who has mentioned this very point, and I said in the early church, especially when they would bring communion like St. Tarsisius in the time of persecution, They'd have a, like this young acolyte boy who was a martyr for the Holy Eucharist. He was bringing the Blessed Sacrament only under the species of bread, the only under the appearance of bread, to those in prison to strengthen them before their martyrdom. So it does not have to be, you don't have to receive both. Our Lord is contained whole and entire under both species. And so it's imperative the priest offers Mass and receives both. He consecrates and receives both, but not for the lay people. Now, if a priest were to offer Mass and right after the consecration he dies, has a heart attack, ambulance comes, takes him away, 
the sacrifice has got to be finished, completed. So a priest, even if he doesn't fast, even if he's done eating breakfast and all of a sudden he gets called, father had a heart attack, he's on the way to the hospital, the consecration has already taken place, the priest has to get vested and then finish the Mass, uh, even though he's not fasting, because the law of completing the sacrifices of a greater obligation than that of the fast. So not necessary that you receive under the species of wine, uh, but that's what's settled at the Council of Trent, and it's not necessary. But if you, if there's a book in the a bookstore called The Church Teaches, and in the back toward the end it talks about um, the sacraments, and it gets right into that very topic. Quotes from the Council of Trent that you don't, do not have to receive under both species. Um, Okay, here's a question about where, when was the word Catholic first used. Uh, this is interesting. You look up in the Webster Dictionary of Words. It, it gives the etymological definition of words, the root definition of words. And if you look up Webster's Dictionary of Words, which is a secular dictionary, under Catholic, it says it comes from the Greek katholikos, which means universal. It was first used by St. Ignatius of Antioch, who died 107 A.D. And then in that same definition, it says, and further was continued to be used, and especially at the Council of Nicaea, when at Council of Nicaea, they said, I believe, in one holy Catholic apostolic church. So long before there were any Protestants and other break-off groups, the word Catholic was being used. So um, is that... Okay, these other questions are going to get into what the topic we're going to talk about this afternoon. I work with high school students. They ask me to identify them not as he or she, but they and thern. Or, uh, is that right? Has that, I can't read that. Uh, Okay, well, I would just do this. Uh, what are you going to do about it if you don't call them that? I'm not sure who was asking the question, where are they coming from? Okay, <clears throat> so would you get in trouble if you don't? I would just I would just simply call them he she. What's that? Oh, you can't tell. I see. I see. I'm not quite sure where that question was going to. You know, it's sad. Very very sad. But I would just tell you something that I thought was pretty interesting. Father Benedict came up with a really good book. And. The title of the book was Sell Pope for Those Who Have These Types of Tendencies, Homosexual Tendencies, or they're, con they're you know, confused. And there was a Dr. Joseph Nicolosi who, uh, how would you say, wrote an approbation to the book. Dr. Joseph Nicolosi, he's passed away this past year, but he was very good at helping to help people that had those irregular or illicit you know, tendencies to help them out. And according to the, the author of the book, he was convinced that there are a lot of things that happen when children are growing up, especially if something happens emotionally to them, some traumatic emotional thing happens that kind of gets them off course. I remember reading a story about this girl um, when she was old enough to understand and whatever her father kept telling her, oh, when you were born, I just wish I it was a boy. I wish you were a boy so we could take you play football and, and take you play baseball and do all these things. And he kept saying that to the girl. And the girl realized, at least she thought, Dad won't love me unless I'm a boy. And that just threw her off course. Emotionally, she was very hurt by that. And she tells her story about how, you know, unfortunately she acted upon this and that sooner or later she was able to turn around and come back. Another thing, too, 
this is, we don't encounter this often, but occasionally you get some some families that might have you know a broken family, mom and dad are divorced and separated, and one of the kids is trying to become a gender they're not. What they should understand is that those who try to transition, the, the suicide rate is very, very high. And why is that? Because they get to a point where they don't know what they are. They can't identify he or she. They don't know. But, I mean, obviously, I would just like to say in general, because of Adam and Eve and original sin, everyone has their inclinations to sin. It all differs according to, you know, every individual. But that doesn't mean that we should use it as an excuse. No excuse. God's grace, God's commandments, God has given us an order, and we are intelligent beings with intellect and free will. And if we have inclinations that are against God's order, then we can control ourselves. We're not animals. And this goes for anything. If somebody likes to light fires and burn stuff, you know, pyromaniac, or, or what if somebody likes to take a baseball bat and hit people on the head, you know? I'm sorry, you can't say you were born that way. You know, it's just not going to, you're going to get in trouble for doing that, and it's wrong, there's a sin against the fifth commandment. You've got to stop hitting people with a baseball bat. So no matter what those tendencies are, God's grace is there, his commandments are there, we have an intellect and free will, and we don't have to be there. But I was surprised that this book, uh, asked Father Benedict to order me about 15 copies, not that I passed them any out, but occasionally when you're across this, I hand it to parents or hand it to someone throughout the country or anywhere <clears throat> where they're struggling because of an issue with a son or a daughter that's confused on that, on those points. So the point is, and we're going to be con confronting this a lot more than I think in the near future. We don't hate anybody. I want everybody to go to heaven. I don't want anybody to go to hell. And that goes for everybody. And if somebody has uh, these, these unfortunate tendencies, this or that, I pray for them. But I'm not going to condone it and not say it's wonderful, great, and more power to you, and, oh, isn't that sweet? No, it's not. So, but I, I, I would, you could ask them, what are you? You know, I just, I don't know what you could say if you don't know who they are. Um, okay, that was that one. A lot of important questions are asked on napkins. <laughs> okay. Okay, we call the errors today modernism. Contemporary philosophers call today's errors neo modernism. Is there really a difference? Well, you always have, when it comes to errors, some fundamental things that are in common. And whether they're old errors or new errors or whatever, the, the tendencies, the principles, the false principles are always the same. The basic tenets of modernism, according to Pope St. Pius X and Pascendi and Lamentabili, first tendency of the modernists was that they believed that it was like a Gnosticism. We can't know God. It's not possible to know God. Uh, another tendency of the modernism, uh, modernists was that... Um, Divine revelation uh, is not very objective, but no, St. Pius X said it is objective. Our faith is objective. We have external proof, especially miracles and prophecies, as the surest signs of the divine origin of our religion. The modernists believed in what was called dogmatic relativism, that dogmas change with the times. What we believed a thousand years ago, we don't believe that today. We're smarter now. And maybe what we believe now is going to change a thousand years ago a thousand years from now. So the idea that morality and dogmas changed with the times. Uh, in the time of Pope Pius XII in the 1950s, uh, there was a, like a, a moral uh, relativity, uh, situation ethics, that things that were objectively sinful, wrong, and evil because of somebody's good intentions or circumstances some, somehow can make it right. And Pope Pius XII condemned that. So... Whatever be the modernism of today, the tendencies, the, 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 the idea of questioning and, and doubting and that truth can change, that things are relative, uh, there's no set absolute truth. No matter what era, I mean, what avenue or aspect it takes on, 
the, the fundamental errors are still there, that things can change, that truth can change, that truth is an absolute. Uh, why not use social media to extend the voice of traditional Catholic teaching? Uh, true, uh, but I guess the thing about social media is this. I'm not 100% sure, sure if it's just talking about the, you know, having a website, internet, or like Father Kasmer tonight, he was uh, in contacting the spokesman review to have a photographer up here to take pictures of our procession. It's kind of a roll of the dice when you're dealing with reporters and the media. Uh, I remember when we first started building our church in 1988 in Omaha, somebody came from the local television station. He was Novus Ordo. And I talked to him for 45 minutes about everything about the changes in the church. And because back then, in the 80s, Father Benedict and Father Casper and I, some of the other priests were giving lectures, and we did those lectures so many times, it's just like it's just coming like that, real easy. And because he's Novus Ordo, he, he, he commented on everything I said, but it was his own twist to it. He probably quoted me for like five seconds and tried to make us look as bad as possible. But as one person said, as long as they spell your name right, don't worry about it because it's going to get the word out that you're there, etc. Well, then we had an article, front page of the Omaha World Herald. That reporter was nothing. He was just a, I don't think he had any religion. Didn't go to church, didn't have any religion. He was very, very objective. It was kind of interesting because he said, now, I'm not a Catholic, but what's the difference between you and a diocese? And I says, I'll make it real simple for you. I believe that Christ founded one true church, and that's the Catholic Church. The diocese does not believe that anymore. So they went to Archbishop Sheehan and asked him, Father Tarsisius over there at Mary Macla Church says that you don't believe there's one true Catholic Church anymore. You don't believe that anymore. Now, how is the Archbishop, the Novus Ordo Archbishop, going to answer that? Because if he says... No, we didn't change. We believe we believed one true. Then all his ecumenical activities go out the window, and he offends the Lutherans, the Methodists, and everybody in town. And on the other hand, if he says, "Yeah, we don't believe that anymore," so he was in the kind of the horns of the dilemma. He said, "We don't want to get into theology in a newspaper." So, just don't even answer the question, which he he didn't answer the question. That was by by the way the same Archbishop. <clears throat> he was pretty close to retirement when I got there, but he was the same Archbishop who. Uh, sent Father Clement Kubish out of the diocese. Father Kubish was not offering the Latin Mass. I mean, he was not offering the English Mass. He was only offering the Latin Mass. And he got called in and talked to the Archbishop, and the Archbishop said, listen, if you just go along with the changes, we'll give you even a higher uh, retirement. Your pension will be higher. And Father Clement said to him, eternity is forever. It's not just for a long time. And he walked out, and that was the end of that. So, you know, in the times that we think of the 1960s, pretty tough for a priest, older priest, close to retirement, and then all of a sudden you're being confronted with things that are contrary to what you've learned in a seminary, contrary to know what the Catholic Church has already taught. Very, very difficult. What do I do? Where do I go? How am I going to support myself? How can this be? Um, Mario Dirksen. Mario Dirksen has given some very nice talks here at the conferences in the past. He wrote a, a nice booklet on Archbishop Took, but he was mentioning how there was the uh, Monsignor Joseph Fenton. He was the v very, very prominent writer and theologian in the United States in the 40s and 50s, uh, wrote for the American Ecclesiastical Review. He went through a major crisis, major crisis, when Vatican II came along, because he had gotten to an argument with a Jesuit by the name of John Courtney Murray. They went head to head. John Courtney Murray wrote for the Theological Studies, the Jesuits' periodical, monthly periodical. Monsignor Joseph Fenton wrote for the American Ecclesiastical Review, and the, the topic was religious liberty. And Father jo Monsignor Joseph Fenton said, your concept of religious liberty has been condemned. The syllabus of error, Pope Pius IX condemned this. You can't say that man could worship God any way he wants and that civil governments should grant freedom of religion to all religions. That's, that's, a false, that's a false principle. 
John Courtney Murray was silenced for the time. And then right before Vatican II, John Courtney Murray and Monsignor Joseph Fenton had it out. And the deck was stacked against the conservatives, and it was voted upon that religious liberty, which later on became dignitatis humanae, this would be something not only talked and, and, and discussed during Vatican II, but it also become a decree and spread universally. That for Monsignor Fenton was huge. How could the church officially teach this now when it's been condemned 100 years ago? Very, very troubling situation there. Uh, and, and sure enough, <clears throat> that's exactly what happened. In fact, I have the book here, The Documents of Vatican II, by Walter M. Abbott, Jes a Jesuit. And before each of the documents of Vatican II, there's a preface, a little introductory thing. And so it is in Dignitatis Humanae, the introductory uh, preface is written by John Courtney Murray, a man that was silenced by his superiors for teaching something contrary to the faith in the 50s. Now he's become an expert in this matter. Interestingly, some of the conservative cardinals and bishops were saying, okay, the syllabus of error condemned religious liberty. You're teaching this. How are you going to explain the transition between condemnation and approbation? John Courtney Murdy said, the experts said, we will have to leave this to future theologians to explain this. I say, wait a minute. You guys are the experts. You know everything. Explain it now. We got time. Let's sit down and let's hear about it. They couldn't. They can't. Vatican II, Dignitatis Humanae, was promulgated on December 7th, 1965, signed by Paul VI. And, in fact, it's interesting, Bishop Gerard de Laurier, he believes that at that point there's no way that Paul VI could have been a true pope. He could not have any authority formally as a pope to be able to, to do that. He had to lose his authority prior to that. There's no way a true pope could sign something that has been previously condemned. So when it comes to uh, the uh, issues with regard to uh, these crises in faith, like Father Clement Kubish and some of the older priests, I remember hearing of a priest who spent two weeks in his car, nowhere to go, no support, what is he going to do, et cetera, et cetera. A very time of great crisis for many people. What I'd like to do is to cover some very quick things here uh, about how clever the devil is. Satan will just try to deceive him, if he can, the elect, uh, and kind of go through what he's done. So, you know what? I'm looking at the clock, and we only have 15 minutes, so we're going to have to really go quickly on this. But I don't want to see any anguish on anybody's face. You know, I teach theology in Omaha to the high school students, and I write on the board... The, the, the seniors keep up, the juniors keep up, the sophomores kind of keep up, and the freshmen are like, <laughs> <laughs> too fast. You see this, it's, the, the look on their face is like something like this. Okay, so I don't want to see that look on anybody's face here, okay? Very interestingly, the changes in the church we know in the 1960s were very, very subtle, such as the words of consecration pro multis, for many. I was talking to someone just recently who was on the fence of leaving the traditional movement, going back to the Novus Ordo, and they're saying, well, this is really, ah, it's not that big of a deal because Christ did die for all men. I said, it is a big deal, because Christ, when he died on the cross, his death was sufficient to save all men. But in the Mass, it is the application of, the, of our Lord's sufferings and death, the fruit of his passion, is applicable not to all, but to many. This is something that was taught by the Catechism of the Council of Trent, it said, with reason were the words for all not used. We also have in the De Defectibus, it's in the front of all the Latin missals, it says, defects 
can arise in the form of the sacrament. These are the words of consecration. It gives the words of consecration. It says if there's any alteration or change which change the meaning, the consecration's invalid. And not only that, but when they change the words to for all, they use this professor who, was, who didn't even believe in the divinity of Christ, Joachim Jeremias, and he came up with an out-and-out lie that there was no words to express what Christ really wanted to say. So even though he said sagian, he really meant for all because there was no word to express all, but that's false. There is a word, kola, which means all, and sagian, which means many. And those Eastern rites that still use the Aramaic use the word sagian. <clears throat> we know that when the Novus Ordo first came out, the definition of the Novus Ordo and the preface to the Novus Ordo, it says the Mass is the gathering together of the people of God with the priest presiding to celebrate the memorial of the Lord. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. That is completely a Protestant concept. It's not the priest as a, as representing Christ, the acting in the person of Christ, changing the bread and wine and the body and blood of Christ, transubstantiation. It's kind of like we get together in the name of Jesus, and Jesus is spiritually in our midst. A completely Lutheran definition. Besides the fact they took out of the Novus Ordo, or out of the Latin Mass, the new, the new Novus Ordo, new Mass, all reference to a propitiatory sacrifice has been stripped out of it. So what you see is what you get. But this is a very subtle thing when promultis, or for, for many, for all, that's, that's very subtle. I mean, I'm thinking this had to come from the devil himself, Satan himself, to know how subtly to slit, slide this in here because a lot of people wouldn't catch it. They wouldn't understand, well, yeah, sure, Jesus did die for all men. Didn't he die for all men? Yeah, he died for all men. It's the same thing with regard to uh, the issue of ecumenism. In the decree on ecumenism, they said, now, we shouldn't do this indiscriminately. Uh, we don't want to go do indiscriminately practicing ecumenism. It depends on two principles. First principle is that it has to show the unity within the church. The second principle is that has to show, it has to manifest a sharing of graces. It says, because of the first principle, unity of the church, you, ecumenism, worship with, common worship with other religions, churches, whatever, rules out, because of unity, that rules out ecumenism, but the needed grace recommends it. So don't do it indiscriminately. Depends on two principles. Because of this principle, you shouldn't do it, but go ahead and do it because you need to share graces. So go ahead and worship with other religions, worship with other churches, uh, practice ecumenism, etc. But I, I would like to get back to what we were talking about before about spiritual adultery. Christ and the church we call the Catholic Church the Bride of Christ, always faithful to Jesus Christ. There's only one way to the Father through Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And when you get into this area of worshiping with other religions, false gods, spiritual adultery, spiritual adultery, and, and recognizing them. Like when, when John Paul II and the later on Benedict XVI had these ecumenical things in Assisi, they invited these religions to come to Assisi, pray to their false gods for world peace. What are they saying? Your prayers to your false gods have benefit. That's what they're telling everybody. How else can you explain that? I was talking to this one individual, kind of on the fence a little bit, and I said, how do you explain that the man who's supposed to be the pope is inviting false religions to pray to their false gods for world peace. Explain that to me. Defend it. And he can't. He couldn't. But let's get to the papacy here. want to... got seven minutes, eight minutes here. Okay. Two things you want to remember about this topic. <clears throat> We're going to do this very quickly. We think of when you think of the Pope, we can think of him as in his position as the supreme head of the church, the vicar of Christ. 
and we can think of them as an individual, as a private person. As a private person, as an individual, he is not impeccable. He can commit sin. Not impeccable. And this is the distinction that sometimes is, is lost. St. Robert Bellarmine talks about these very things. As the supreme head of the church, when he speaks ex cathedra, which means from the chair in his official capacity as pope, okay, supreme head, and to the universal church, Matter of faith or morals, and he binds the faithful. Ex cathedra does not mean solemn, because the Pope can speak ex cathedra even in an encyclical. The point to be made are these three things Supreme Head. Universal church, faith and morals, and he's binding the faithful. You have to believe this. Now, interestingly, some people think that ex cathedra is something very, very rare, and that's not true either. There are two aspects, or say, objects of the church's infallibility. The primary object of infallibility are those things that are from Scripture, and tradition. When the church teaches on these matters, that's the primary object of the church's infallibility. But of infallibility. But there's also a secondary object of infallibility. And that secondary object of infallibility are those things that are closely related to scripture and tradition. So that a universal law is protected by the infallibility of the church. There's no way a pope, a true pope, can issue a universal law that's contrary to faith and morals because our salvation depends on what we're commanded to do by the man that is the head of the church. This is where people go astray. If the pope as an individual person, as a private purpose, person, says, go rob a bank and give me the cash or go kill somebody because he's been bad-mouthing me, you disobey because that's a sin. We obey God before man. However, there's no way that the Pope can issue a universal law saying all Catholics should murder all my enemies. He can't do that. God would not allow it. God protects the Pope from making such a law because of infallibility, the inability to err. Universal laws are one. The liturgy is another. Universal laws, the liturgy, these are things that affect us more often than not. The church cannot present to the, the, to the faithful a defective liturgy. The law of prayer is the law of belief. Canonizations. Canonizations are another aspect of the church's infallibility and a secondary object. What does this mean? It means this. St. Francis Xavier Cabrini. She was canonized a saint, and we infallibly know she is in heaven. We can pray to her. We can have a mass and office in honor of St. Francis Xavier Cabrini. Is this a part of the primary object of infallibility? No. St. Francis Xavier Cabrini is not found in sacred scripture tradition. Okay? That was like 2,000 years ago. But... It's closely related to this, that the church, as the mystical body of Christ, is praying in her liturgy and honoring the saints, something that is dogmatically, you know, something we do and something we believe because it's been revealed by God, the intercession of the saints, is reflected more often than not than in the liturgy when we pray to these saints. And canonizations have to be infallible. Universal laws have to be infallible. Liturgy has to be infallible. Now, this is what I'd like to just briefly bring about, and that is I have two codes of canon law. This is the 1917 Code of Canon Law. 
in which it forbids Catholics, priests, ministers to give the sacraments to heretics and schismatics. It's forbidden, even if they ask in good faith. Here's the new code of canon law by John Paul II in 1983, and he says, yes, you can give the sacraments to heretics and schismatics. They don't call them heretics. They call separated brethren or other Christians, etc., etc., but the understanding is still the same. This is authorizing sacrilege. There's no way a true pope could and would do that. So when we look at two things, we look at the infallibility of the pope, we also look at him as an individual, there's two things that come to my mind. Francis I, John Paul II, John Paul I, Paul VI, John XXIII, insofar as these Novus Ordo, Vatican II popes, false popes, on two heads. The one head is as an individual, private person. If they fall into heresy, the sin of heresy, they are automatically severed from the church. Pope Pius XII, in his encyclical, The Mystical Body of Christ, said, other sins, no matter how grave they are, do not sever you from the body of the church as does heresy and schism. And why is that? Because the church is a visible society by which we can know who's a member and who's not a member. Now, if as an individual they manifestly teach heresy, publicly teach heresy, they're not a part of the church. St. Robert Bellarmine talks about two things. How do we know someone's a member of the church? They're baptized. See, this is very objective. You're baptized or not baptized, and you publicly profess the Catholic faith. That's how you know someone's a member of the church. So a heretic, a manifest heretic, he's not capable of being elected. That's number one. And I know many moons ago we wrote this uh, little booklet here on uh, answering the, ch- the questions of the study of the contest position. Uh, we have more copies of this if you want, but we go through the t- quotes after quotes after quotes after quotes answering the questions that are raised against this position. But Pope Paul IV in 1559 said, if it ever appears that a heretic's been elected as pope, the whole election's invalid and void. No way can a, uh, can a heretic be elected pope. And also Pope Innocent III, see Papa, he also wrote, if a pope were to fall into heresy, he loses his authority. And not only that, but St. Robert Bellarmine, St. Antoninus, St. Alphonsus Liguori, canonists say, public heretic, manifest heretics, if, if a pope is a manifest heretic, he loses the papacy, he can't be the pope. See, what people are trying to say today, which is refuted by St. Robert Bellarmine, is this. He's a heretic, but he's still the pope. Because then where's the church? The gates of hell then have prevailed against this man. Because if he's the rock, he's not much of a rock if he's teaching heresy and leading the church astray. Christ said, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. So with the new code of canon law saying, give communion to non-Catholics, to Protestants and schismatics and heretics, whatever, there's no way that could be binding in heaven. That is the reason why we know there's no way these men are true popes because they're contradicting not man-made law, they're contradicting divine law. This whole thing of ecumenism, spiritual adultery, the idea of go ahead and worship with other religions, other churches, and then practicing it, blatantly practicing it, that's a neon sign. This is apostasy. In fact, Pope Pius XI in his encyclical Mortali Manimo said to promote false ecumenism is equivalent to apostasy, abandoning the religion revealed by God. So on either score, if you look at him as an individual, individually, if you're committing a sin of heresy, a heretic. But also in this area, when it comes to universal laws or the liturgy, there's no way a true pope can present to the church a defective liturgy. No way that he can present to the universal church a universal law that is contrary to faith and morals. Impossible. Can't happen. We can also get into Vatican II as a pastoral council. Was it an ecumenical council? No. Pope Leo XIII and Satis Cognitum said, if the living magisterium, the pope and bishops, if the living magisterium could teach error, then an evident contradiction would follow because God would be the author of the error. Why? Because Christ said, he who hears you, hears me. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. The magisterium represents Christ. This is the the, the, the dilemma today. These men are walking around as if they're the Pope and if they're the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, and they're blatantly 
contradicting divine law, blatantly contradicting past popes, blatantly con- contradicting what the Catholic Church has taught. This is what I think is nothing less than the apostasy. And, and we have to be aware of this because it's a matter of our perseverance. I'd like to end on one last note very quickly. If these times seem to be really strange, which they are, and difficult to grasp, in which they are, God tests his faithful. You know, as gold is purified in the fire, so are the faithful by tribulations and temptation. Stockmen think if you're Noah building an ark, you build this huge boat, and there's no water around. Like, you are crazy. But God told them to do that. Abraham was told, take your son Isaac, your only son, sacrifice him. How's this going to be? I'm supposed to be the father of a great nation. Look at the stars of heaven. That's going to be my posterity. How am I going to do that? Sacrifice your son. In the time of Christ, when our Lord was dying on the cross, our Blessed Mother, St. Mary Magdalene, Salome, just a few women, St. John, handful of people. Our Lord, when he walked this earth, those who were the head of the temple, high priest, scribes, Pharisees, rejected Christ. They thought he was a false Messiah. Could you imagine the dilemma of the Jews? Hey, man, they're part of the temple. They're part of the synagogue. And, but they're saying he's not it. But he's working miracles. How do you explain that? Very trying, very difficult. And I think just as it was in the time of Christ, so it is today. The ones who should know better, should recognize what's going on, they're the very ones who are rejecting the one true church of Christ. We had a ton of things we had to cover with you. Uh, we run out of time, but I would just like to share one thing with you, and that is when it comes to perseverance, don't go by emotion. Use your head and go by faith. What has God revealed? It doesn't matter if this man up there, Bergoglio, Francis I, is wearing a white robe and everything he's the Pope and he goes in the Pope mobile and he, he can do what he wants, blah, blah, blah. When he says he can break the sixth commandment of God, sorry, can't do that. And, and all of his prede- he and his, all of his predecessors, spiritual adultery with this false ecumenism, sorry, this doesn't cut it. I, when, I, when I talk to people who are on the fence, I say, these people are so phony, it isn't even funny. It, it's not even funny. I, I, there's so many examples we can give. One example is John Paul II approved of certain priests using for the Eucharist not wheat and bread and grape wine, but some type of kava root. That ain't even invalid matter. I mean, who do you think he's kidding? Benedict XVI, when he was cardinal, quote-unquote Cardinal Rattinger, with the approval of John Paul II, said Catholics can go to the schismatic church, the Assyrian Church of the East. Problem? Their liturgy does not have, their mass, quote-unquote, doesn't even have a consecration. How can you have a mass without a consecration? They say, no, it's valid. People, Catholics can go to that. We approve that's a valid mass. I'm sorry, you don't have to have a whole lot of Catholic knowledge to know without a consecration, it's not a mass. Who do these people think they're fooling? Well, they're feeling, fooling a lot of people, but because of, the, because of being public, but for those who are living by their faith, they're not, fooling, they're not fooling us. They shouldn't fool us. How can you have a consecration, or how can you have a mass without a consecration? It just can't happen. Sorry, it just, it's not. And for them to say it is... Where is their head? No, they, they, these people are, to me, destroying the faith of the f- many, many people. They're leading people away. They're part of the apostasy. And it's beyond, beyond making excuses for them. I have a, I'm have a little bit over time, but I did one last thing I want to share with you before I forget. And that is with regard to this magazine. This magazine was sent to me free, and like I say, remember I told you I like stuff that's free. It's called The Traditionalist. It's put out by a man by the name of Roger McCaffrey. And he has a, has a critique on apostolic exhortation of Maurice Laetitia. I'm going to read a little bit to you here. 
The following analysis does not deny or question the personal faith of Pope Francis. It is not legitimate or justifiable to deny the faith of any author on the basis of a single text. This is especially true of the case of the Supreme Pontiff. There are further reasons why the text of Amoris Laetitia cannot be used as a sufficient reason for holding the Pope has fallen into heresy. The document's extremely long, and probably much of its original text was produced by another author or authors who are not Pope Francis. So he said, we don't even know if he wrote it, put his name to it, but he went off if he wrote it. Maybe he doesn't even know what's in it. Those statements which, on face value, contradict the faith could be due to part to simple error. He doesn't know any better. Or rather to a voluntary rejection, rather than to a voluntary rejection of the faith. When it comes to the document itself, however, there's no doubt that it constitutes a grave danger to the Catholic faith and morals. And then you start reading, they take excerpts from Amoris Laetitia, it's listed A-L, and then they give the, the, what, what they consider the, the theological grade. Heretical, heretical contrary to scripture. Taking all these different statements. Impious, blasphemous, pernicious. I mean, they tear it apart. This man has promoted this. He continues, not only, okay, let's say you try to make an excuse and say, well, he really didn't write this, and maybe it was so long, somebody else wrote it. No, his personal comments that he makes on a regular basis individually shows this is exactly what he thinks, exactly what he believes. And we're, we're going to say it's a simple error on the part of the man who's supposed to be the Pope. He doesn't know the sixth commandment. That is utterly preposterous. So, my dear friends in Christ, we don't come here very often, once a year for the Fatima Conference. We've covered a lot of topics. There's always other things we can cover with you. I just hope and pray we can live Our Lady's message at Fatima, especially pray the rosary, try to create the Catholic atmosphere in your homes, get rid of occasions of sin for your children, try to create that atmosphere that's going to be conducive to living a life of keeping God's commandments and not committing sin. Know your faith, steady your faith, and how important it is that we persevere in these times. Our Lord in the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 24 says, tells about all these things happening, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, etc., etc. But he ends by saying, but he who perseveres to the end, he shall be saved. So that should be, and that needs to be our goal. St. Alphonsus Liguori said, you've got to pray for perseverance every single day. It is tragic when we see people fall away. They become spiritually blinded. They can't see the obvious. But it really comes to a matter of grace. If, if our Lord could walk this earth, work miracles, and they said he's not the Messiah, we shouldn't be surprised that what we say, what we try to explain to people, if they can't see it either. So pray and sacrifice, like Our Lady said, for conversion of sinners. Remember, when you're working with someone, trying to help them understand what's going on in the church, pray for them, sacrifice for them. Help them to gain those graces. And also remember this, too. Try not to give them too much too soon. Do it prudently and explain things gradually. If, if you have someone come new to your church or your mass center, you try to explain in three minutes why the Mass is no good, Vatican is no good, and he's not the Pope, and they're going to be like, they're going to be totally bewildered, like, what are you talking about? What planet did you land from, you know? So uh, with this in mind, thank you for your time. I'm glad that we had the opportunity to talk to you. i like to, uh, we're going to lead Grace, and then after that, I think we have lunch, and we're 10 minutes over. Forgive me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the